Welcome, fans, to the 54th episode of Changeover Chat, presented by Sportmaster Sports Surfaces. I'm your host, Randy Master. Today's guest is a former ATP player who reached a high of number 34 in the world in singles in 1987 and was a member of the Czechoslovakian Olympic team in 1992. He went on to become the captain of both the Slovakian Davis Cup and Fed Cup teams. And as a coach, he began coaching Carol Kuchera, otherwise known as the Little Cat, in 2001 through 2004, and has coached now world number one Novak Djokovic since 2006. Novak has won 18 Grand Slam titles under his tutelage, a record for any coach in history. The ATP named him 2018 Coach of the Year. He joins us tonight from Slovakia. Please welcome Marian Vida. Hello, everybody. Thank you for welcoming me and inviting me for this show. I really appreciate this. And uh, hello, Random. <laughs> uh, hello, Marian, and thank you for coming on. It, it, it's a, it's going to be a pleasure and a lot of fun. So, when a lot of people hear your name, Marian, in tennis and all over the world, now. Sometimes you immediately think, oh, yeah, he's Novak's coach, which isn't such a bad thing. But you're an accomplished man in your own right and a player and a, and a captain. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, Marian Vida as a kid growing up, how you got into the sport. It's a funny story because, uh, first of all, my father, Joseph, uh, he was really, uh, besides, he was a great uh, doctor and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, had a knowledge in medicine. Uh, he was a passionate uh, sportsman. And uh, besides many sports like skiing, uh, table tennis, he fell in love uh, once in tennis. I don't know how, I don't know the story, but uh, he was so passionate for this game that he built it up just the place where we lived that time. He built it up the tennis court. So my first experience, I went to, because I had a very nice childhood, I went to hit with my best friend. Uh, and I see the other guys that are gathering around the court. And I, I told him, listen, let's, let's hit a let's hit couple balls. So I, I took the rackets. And then, unfortunately, uh, first uh, rally we played, I hit him straight in the head. <laughs> somehow <laughs> he went into the net. <laughs> and I hit him full. I hit him full somehow by the chance, by accident. He hit him straight in the forehead, <laughs> and that was my first experience to, with the tennis. <laughs> so how how was how was he afterwards? Did he uh, did he ever hit with you again? <laughs> yeah, I mean he starts crying. We were just about eight, and uh, obviously we became uh, friends for a long time. <laughs> And uh, obviously, this this uh, this uh, story uh, it, it went with us for for a, for a longer period of time, and we always remind us as a, as a very good friends. So, after you hit that kid on the head, you went on to become a great great player. You reached a high of number thirty four in singles on the tour in nineteen eighty seven. Tell me a little bit about Marian Vida, the player, and the moments in your career that really, really stand out for you? Well, uh, actually, I have to go a little bit back to my uh, junior level uh, career. And we had a very good system in Czechoslovakia for the sports. We, we, we grew up in, among the players as, as was Ivan Landl and uh, Thomas Smith and uh, Pavel Slogil which captured uh, the first uh, Davis Cup for Czechoslovakia in 1980. So I was following them as a 16-year-old boy, uh, maybe 15-year-old uh, boy. I was watching uh, with uh, breathless, breathless, breathless uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the final in Prague. So that was my inspiration. That was my, uh, you know, my goals and my dreams because I saw already 1980 winning Czechoslovakia first title Davis Cup title, as that was an amazing, amazing moment, and maybe decisive for my career. And during that time, we had a very good sportsman and very good system, as I as I mentioned before. So uh, basically, uh, I had always uh, 
uh, good tennis around me. There was always, I had a very good uh, club tennis in Bratislava where I moved from the place I, I mentioned before, small town. We moved to Bratislava as my family. So uh, I had a very good coaches already that time. And uh, basically I came from junior tennis to senior tennis to ATP tour. And I was basically very seriously, I, hard, I tried hard for two years from 18 to 20 and then when i uh, uh and I, uh, after uh, 1985 i i became a let's say uh professional i start to be involved more seriously in in tennis and i after breaking through through the satellites idf futures and everything it took me two years to to become let's say professional tennis player in 1985 and i I really admit that because that was uh, really tough from Czechoslovakia to to go to the to the pro circuit because we had really really great players that time and uh, and uh, my motivation was uh, obviously to travel to to be a better tennis player that time was during the uh, iron curtain uh, we couldn't travel so my motivation was travel and play lots of tournament and then as I became uh, very good in Czechoslovakia and I had a high level of tennis, so in 1985 I became uh, to top first time to top top hundred, and then I roll on for a couple of years for let's say seven years, and my best year was 1987 when I really break through. I won uh, uh, I won the Prague Chadog Open that time 1987, and uh, uh, along the most of the results i had during the year 87 which i had the best results and uh, i became uh, after 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 that i became number 34 in august before us open so it was uh it was it was quite a road to get to that point and you hit your peak as you said in 1987 ultimately you start coaching carol Kuchera. what and I think you were still on tour, Marion, when you started coaching him, or had you finished up your career? I have to mention my, my first pupil, because after my career in 1995, actually I finished after 13 years of pro tennis, and uh, actually I made my decision to stay with my family, to be home for a while, because I was traveling a lot, and... Uh, that's time in my club in Bratislava, where I live now. It came management and uh, he came to me and they, they mentioned one name. And his name was Dominic Herbati. He was 320 yeah. that time. Yeah. So he was my first pupil, actually. It was in, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, so, okay. And then he used to wear the uh, shirts with the holes in the back. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Lots of, lots yeah. Of. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. No, he, he was a he was a character, but he was a very good player. So then uh, you move on in 2006. You start coaching at that time, a little known Serbian player by the name of Novak Djokovic. How did that relationship get started with Novak? Did they reach out to you, his agent or parents or you reach out to him? How did that how did that all flourish from the beginning? It's also an amazing story because that time I was coaching, as you mentioned before, I was a captain of national team, national squad, women's, and the year before. And then uh, I was, after that, I stopped coaching and I had a time for my family. My daughter started playing and I was looking to open my first academy that time in Mallorca and uh, in Slovakia. And uh, meantime, my friend, very good friend of mine, Branislav Stankovic, called me that uh, uh, Novak's agency called him up to find out the coaches because Novak was three months without coach and he's, he was already 70 in the world. He stopped co coaching with, uh, uh, with uh, Ricardo Piatti and in mid-time he was a big gap for him and he was looking for coaches all over the world, actually his agency. But they, in some connection, and I tell you the story later maybe, it's... Uh, they, they find my friend and my friend called me up and I said, listen, Brano, I, I don't know who is the guy, Djokovic. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm coaching women. I, 
I don't want to travel so much. I had a lot of guys already, Herbati, Kuchera, squad of uh, Slovakian uh, Fed Cup team, and I'm fine. I'm, I'm doing my, on my own. And, and then uh, tell them to... Uh, so they call me up and I told them, listen, guys, call me in three days because I have to make... It's not all my own decision. It's decision of my family. So... Uh, uh, and later on, I, I called my family and my daughters and I, I proposed them basically to trip to Paris because they told me, listen, uh, they, the agency told me to, to meet Novak in Paris during Roland Garros. So I called up, I, I called my daughter and, and uh, she said she was 10 years old. Yeah, daddy, let's go, let's go, let's go. So let's go to Paris. I've never been in, in Roland Garros. So <laughs> basically the decision was made by my daughter <laughs> so in 2006 I met first time with Novak in Rangaro uh, at the Rangaro and uh, I met his parents and his family there so when you start so you started with Novak you get to Paris you hit with him on the clay courts on the red clay at Roland Garros uh, probably your first time really getting out on the court with Novak as his coach, what did you see right away that that either surprised you, hey, this guy is really good, or, hey, he's got some work to do? What was your first kind of perception? I think the last, I would take the last sentence because, and I saw him straight on the court. He was practicing with uh, 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 Rojos uh, and, uh, uh, I mean, it was not, nothing extraordinary, but I, I actually, I, I, it's also a funny story because I asked my <laughs> daughter, uh, who was beside me standing and said, I asked her, so what do you think of this guy? He was playing really good. Uh, he was a hell of an athlete. I saw his athleticism was incredible, incredible, nice and uh, solid and everything. But I saw a couple technical let's say gaps there but uh, overall he was a competitor i saw that he doesn't give up any ball and i see that his game is in frame and he he see the ball perfectly clean and hits the clean and uh, and the ball goes from the racket so i have anyhow i just for fun i asked my daughter natalia listen uh, what do you think of this guy and she says daddy it looks good, but his back end doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, ironic, uh, considering his back end, his back end now. Um, well, it certainly started to work, and it worked to get him the 2008 Australian Open. At that time, Marion, did you ever in a million years think that you would be sitting here today when you saw that? in 2008 and to think he won um he had eight more aussies or he was on track for eight australian opens and 17 overall slams ever cross your mind at that time that that he'd be uh on to becoming one of the greatest ever no i frankly no actually i took it when I met him first time in Paris, I took it as a responsible job for, for like for all the other athletes, which is incredibly responsible because his ambitions was high and his family and especially his father was pointing out that he will be, he will be number one in the world. So it took me somehow on the way. And uh, actually after winning his first ATP title in uh, Amersfoort, I realized this guy is really competitive, and he he loves he loves to he loves winning, he loves uh, uh, he has a winning attitude, and mentality is a is a fighter is a is a is a really like he has a passion in what he's doing. So anyhow, I had no clue if if he will be. I I cannot judge that time. He will be such a great player and uh, uh, in for a long long time no it's it's it was day by day and he, he actually he had a desire always to improve his game and that's what counts for me the most yeah. i never look at his ambitious as mine i look at 
his ambition as a coach, a professional coach, which looking for his uh, uh, weapons as his uh, weaknesses, how to improve. I always look at the subject, or obviously human being and the player and top player, top athlete, how to improve him. So, so this was my asset, which I used always on daily routine. And I see it always in the, in the perspective. So on the long run and uh, giving him goals, uh, always, uh, 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 you know, uh, because he was determined. And I see his will and I see his uh, motivation. It, you don't have to tell him, you know, to practice or practice more. He always took very seriously every practice. And uh, he was there, not 100, 150 percent, I would say, uh, in every every practice. Even he was actually every career, he was limited with uh, many, many, you know, like uh, he had a problem with uh, food and then he changed his food habits. And, uh, you know, he, fitness wise, he need to improve, but he was always able to do it. He was always able to see that he needs to develop and he needs to improve all, always on daily basis. And, uh, you know, and uh, that was my role that time. Right. Well, I read a story this morning that in 2010, Novak lost a match there at Roland Garros. I think it was a quarterfinal match. And he was actually considering quitting tennis. Now, you can tell me if this is accurate. And then I think, I think it was you, Marion, that may have, talked him off the cliff and gotten him to not quit the game. <laughs> Thank God we would have missed so much uh, if he had quit in 2010 with only one Grand Slam. Um, is there a lot of accuracy to him uh, actually wanting to get out of the game? Uh, right, uh, Random. Uh, great uh, question because there are always up and downs, right? Ups and downs, always, always. There is no only ideal, ideal career. And there was a lot of downs as well uh, because uh, he was very impatient, uh, and uh, he had a period of time where he cannot catch up with Nadal and Federer, and uh, uh, it was always, you know, because he was very committed uh, that he will be number one. But it took uh, took us together long five years. Obviously, me and our team that time, obviously. We were always with him, and then uh, you know, uh, at the early beginning, I was a little bit more with him. But but later on, when he was able to create his team, so we helped him everybody there. But uh, we came through the downs as well, and uh, obviously there was period of time, and it was 2010 when he lost to Meltzer to set Sulab up. And then lost in five in quarterfinal of Roland Garros. And then he was he started really seriously thinking that he wants to quit and he wants to do something different. <laughs> but then my question is, what different? What what else you could do? That was that was like <laughs> question, what else you should you should do or you could do besides that you already you are determined in such a big uh, big goal uh, and you set up the your your goals already for a long time. So it was pretty funny for me to listen listen to the story, but anyhow, I was there just to tell him and remind him his goals. And obviously, that's absolutely normal the, to have a little breakdown at the moment. But uh, after that, I remember after Roland Garros when I we didn't hear for a long time. We didn't hear maybe for one or two weeks. And after two weeks, he, he called me up and said, "Marian, I changed I I changed my mind. <laughs> so what, what happened, Ole? What happened?" I, I mean, I want to play Wimbledon. I said, do you want to play Wimbledon? Are you sure? So if you want to play Wimbledon, I don't go with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, so, so you didn't go with him? I said, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, the world thanks you for what you did there because uh, we would have missed a, uh, a whole lot of some of the greatest tennis we've ever seen uh, in a lifetime. I think, um, Marion, from what I have read, and because your relationship uh, has gone on for so long, Novak uh, considers you a dear friend, um, a, you know, a, a human being 
first, a friend first, a coach second. That relationship between the two of you, how much do you think that correlates into his success on the court, knowing that the person that coaches him that's in his box every tournament for every match is also a, is also a special friend. How important do you think that relationship uh, is off the court to what he does on the court? I, it's a, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we, I, we have to say that we've been for, for, uh, for such a long time together and uh, it's not only became uh, professional on professional level, but also the personal life. And we share that. And uh, obviously on mutual, mutual, we share absolutely insiders of, of our privacy. And uh, actually it gives me a lot of, a lot of credit. And uh, I feel like I'm honored by, by telling that always truth. And, uh, you know, from Novak, he told me um, always when he, when he wants to say that he's a hard time or something that, he needs to absolutely to stay behind him and to, to hold him, uh, you know, to stand behind him and uh, and you know to show him the that I, I share every moment with him. So it, it gives gives him uh, beliefs that you know he has a, somebody who who is who stays always you know besides him and uh, lead him uh, not only as a professional coach but also also uh, as a person who, who can trust. And uh, I mean, I never break his trust and uh, I think uh, he realized that. And then uh, obviously we could share many, many things. So uh, this is very important for tennis because tennis is in individual and uh, he needs a big ego, which I don't like this word, but uh, it's, it's kind of, you have to focus. Let's say, let's say better, you have to focus on yourself more right you know in a way that you have to really focus and concentrate on on, on the on the uh, uh every day you know not only the the practice but also the matches matches and then you know i mean whenever whenever he needs the support obviously uh novak went through a lot of changes and uh, obviously uh at the beginning he needed me more let's say in some some tactical technical whatever whatever i opened the shelves for him in the in the, in the tennis game but later on he needed me maybe more like uh, like a mentalist like a mentor uh and just to you know just to confirm that he is doing right right moment at, at the right at the right moment the right steps so i was more like coaching more like mentor more like you know but still with my team, we always were pretty much precise. We did our daily routine, our planning and everything. But actually, it's very important uh, because it, Novak is family man. He loves his family. <laughs> and, you know, so I became like a part of the family. And so and uh, he built up this trust. Also, when I am in the box, he always, you know, it's sometimes it's just enough look. Sometimes it's just words. Sometimes it's just the move. Sometimes it's, you know, it takes in a, it's not always good or, or, or always good, but also in some tough moments, it's, it's maybe, you know, Novak can, can gain the confidence for the game. Yeah, I would say. Well, I have had, uh, I've had a number of great coaches on my show. I've had Brad Gilbert on. I've had Paul Anacone on. I've had Craig Carden on. Uh, coaches that have had great success with great players. All of them have a different way of going about coaching top players or really coaching anybody at the pro level. Brad Gilbert, when he first started working with Andre Agassi, basically said, like, all Andre thought about was his side of the court. Just go out there and rip the ball. I'm going to win the match. I've got more talent. Um, and he would try to win just on his – obviously, he was probably as talented as anybody out there. Um, when Brad took over as his coach, he said, Andre, do you ever look at what's going on on the other side of the net? Like, do you look at your opponent's weaknesses? Do you know how to break them down? Do you know how to strategize based on what they're doing over there? 
Um, so the question is, Marion, when you coach Novak, does he – do you focus on him and his game and how are you feeling today, Novak? What, you know, are, are you feeling like your serve's clicking or your forehand's clicking? Um, talking about him, or are you more focused on his opponent – and what he needs to do tactically to break him down, or is it a little bit of both? I think it's a, it's a, as you said, random. It's a, uh, it's a little bit of both. I think uh, I think it's 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 very good to focus on Novak mostly because you always strive for uh, improvement his game, and this is very very little things. Uh, happening and you know it's it's either you work on technical part or uh, you tactical but uh, you always build up his confidence you know but confidence always comes through the, through genuine uh, work you know and uh, i mean in this these guys like andre and the top guys and the great players and the legends i would say they always went through the uh, i would say hell in the good way, you know, that they, they, they were able to, we know Andre, how, how his stories and everything. So this is, this is, this is facing all the players. They have to go through the pain, sweat, and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, overcomings, uh, tough, difficult moments and obstacles, uh, either private, either, either uh, on the court and uh, facing the match points. And this, this, this builds your confidence and, and, and only champions has the, uh, recipe how to do it they they either they go through the a lot of matches or either they go through to the moments and they remember or did they have a, a fantastic memory for the uh, seeing the matches uh, 3d or whatever they they have this secret and they never they uncover uncover that this is not the point but point is that i am working on on all the subject obviously uh I am focusing more on Novak. I, 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 I never went to other players or other coaches and tried to talk that much about this and this because Novak is really, uh, on one way, it's a fantastic experience to coach him because to improve him, it's in, as I said, in these little things, it's tremendous work and tremendous focus from, from uh, as a coach. But on the other hand, it's also frustrating in, in, in a way that he has to win always, 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 every final and every match and every Grand Slam and everything. So it's amazing, <laughs> exhausted for the coach. And that's why I'm focusing only primarily on, on himself and my team, obviously, yeah. recently and, uh, and past in the past. Right. And this, uh, you know, these tactics and the way you go about coaching – uh, a player, um, and at his level, uh, has certainly worked for you over the years in a huge way. I want to talk about some of Novak's uh, famous matches, classic matches, comeback matches, just three, and just three parts of those three matches with Novak. I always think of the 2010 and 2011 semifinals against Roger at the U.S. Open, uh, I was I was at both of those matches. The one thing that sticks out for me in the 2010 match, he's match point down. He is on the ad side near the um, near the doubles alley. Takes a ball out of the air in about no man's land. And rips a winner. What were you thinking? Were you thinking like what? Oh my God! Don't do this. And the match is over. <laughs> Or were you thinking, okay, he can hit this shot, and it didn't seem bizarre that he was going to take the ball out of the air? I mean, absolutely, that match was incredible, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> two match points down, and then uh, you know, obviously, that forehand that's just uh, that's that's the way of the champions how they do it. You know, they <laughs> the the ability to focus at the right moment, <laughs> it's it's amazing and. <laughs> Unexpected for everybody. Uh, it's out of mind of uh, um, mortal players or mortal people. <laughs> we co we call them uh, legends and mortal uh, when they win the Grand Slam, you know. But anyhow, they are normal people. Just 
have a good focus. They ha they have somehow they know how to do it, and it's just about also not the luck, but uh, I, I mean we always say this uh, proverb, whatever we say is uh, the better prepared, the better player. You know, this is like we use this word like uh, if you are prepared, and I always. I always told him that if you are good prepared, the luck will come. You know, the luck will come. <laughs> and, uh, you know, call it as, as you want. The luck, obviously, how you can say it's not the luck. 15, he hit unbelievable forehand and changed the momentum. It's it's just like this in tennis. It's an incredible game and I we really love it. We, most of us, we love it. So, 2011, it's deja vu. He's down 45, Roger serving in the fifth, uh, two match points, he absolutely unloads on a cross court return to save, that first, to save that first match point. He then, in the most stressful time you can possibly imagine for a player in, a, in the fifth set against Roger Federer, kind of looks up into the crowd and is like, come on, like give me, give me some credit there. The place goes crazy. He ends up winning the next point, winning the match. Do you think, with Novak, what was kind of going through his mind, do you think, after he hit that win, or he's still down match point, and it was almost like it, it was almost like he was out there pr playing a practice match at that time, because he was like, come on, <laughs> like, did that, A, did it surprise you, and B, do you think it threw Roger off a little bit, and I don't think that's what Novak was trying to do, but what was your feeling? That was an interesting time. I think Novak... Uh... <laughs> It's a great uh, because uh, he loves the U.S. Open crowd in the way that uh, obviously they cheer for uh, Roger at that time, uh, you know, that moment uh, uh, a lot. And then uh, he just was uh, curious why they don't support him after after such a point that he won with winning forehand cross court winner. Uh, and and then uh, he just lift up his arm and he said, "Let's say, guys, please give me a little support. Give me a little, please, guys, a uh, little club." So then, then 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 he got a little bit of of the of the crowd on his side, and then yeah. I think that that game was also incredible. And then he got back again, and then <laughs> after yeah. that, uh, you know, he, the crowd helped him a lot that time, and he lift up this level, unbelievable. Yeah, it really is incredible. And then just quickly, you go to the 2019 final with, again, Roger serving for the match. He saves two match points. I remember, like it was yesterday, Roger hit an inside out. He missed on that first one. Then Roger, it's interesting. He didn't hit the greatest approach shot in the world. And everybody's like, oh, my God, he should have hit it deeper. Maybe he shouldn't have come in. I'm like, Novak still had to pass him. You know, it's not like, oh, he didn't hit a great approach, so... He can easily pass. I mean, he was match point down. So um, another shot that probably is uh, entrenched in your memory forever when he saved that second match point. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's exactly as you said. It's like yesterday. And uh, I had uh, goosebumps now, even if, you say, if you're telling about this, because it's, 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 I, I close my eyes at 15.40, and then uh, I mean I I was just uh, uh, I was just uh, saying is it gonna happen again? And I remember that match from US Open 2011, because I had a lot of emotions that that time. But I later on I watched the video, and if you can say that Roger didn't hit that, that approach at 30 40 I mean 40 30 didn't hit that approach that good, it was just in the middle of the court, let's say. But anyhow, in that moment, to make it that easy, how Novak passes him, it means that, you know, <laughs> you can say tennis looks simple from Novak's side, right? Yeah. Uh, probably his mind is working like this. He's never, never going to be, when he has it, he never, as, as we said, it's a tough moment. Maybe for him, it's just a moment, you know, which is like, most of the moments in, in this game <laughs> and absolutely it's a thrill moment for all of us but for him it was just the moment which you know he still he still believes that it can change at that moment he can yeah. change the yeah. momentum well marion you know novak uh, as well as anybody and so does uh, our mutual friend gordon euling 
uh, Gordon and I spoke recently, and he, he talked very highly of Novak as you know a trusted friend and a very kind, kind human being. Someone that actually, when he goes out to a restaurant and has a and has a meal, actually goes back into the kitchen, and and thanks to the chef and the people that that cooked his meal and just so many examples of uh, how he cares deeply about human beings. Can you, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about your experience with uh, the side of Novak that some people don't know about, just how, uh, you know, how quality uh, of an individual he is? Absolutely. He's a, absolutely. He has a quality, personal qualities, uh, you know, big character and uh, stay humble, always down to ground and down to earth and always, always, uh, you know, see in many things in perspectives. And uh, I think he knows how to divide his personal life, private life, family life, friends life, uh, and uh, and then tennis career. He always, you know, uh, believes uh, in many things uh, in his very, uh, you know, he, he, he interesting in the in the you know uh, spiritual energies, and he's into it so much. So he believes that at, he is a, a, as a, as a human humankind and a human being. We are almost on the same level, so he doesn't want to be uh, anything more than the other people. And because he knows that everybody, every individual, share all the feelings among all, all the all the all the people so he feels that way and he doesn't want to be uh you know let's say different it, even though in, as a tennis player is really different from from all the others and you know and he's specific in the way that he provides as he provides tennis on the court but in the life he's just a novak djokovic just by himself you know it is He's not, uh, his face is the same, you know, and he likes to talk, he's, he socialize and he likes to talk among the people. And uh, as you mentioned, Gordon is a fellow friend and then, you know, and uh, it doesn't feel like that he wants to show off something, you know, like he wants to give the people, even when he's showing his expression after when he wins the, when, wins the match, after, after the, he, he, he gives the greets on the court, you know, to the people. And uh, I think uh, it's very sympathetic because he share with the people also love and passion for this sport. And not only that, but that he loves the, the crowd, which they, they really deserve really big credit and also the support as a crowd because they came to see something extraordinary. They, they came to see the tennis and tennis, which Novak transferred through, through himself. And that's why he wants to express him of this way and even he's criticized for his emotional uh, greetings uh, after the match i think it's very very nice uh gesto gesture gesture to the to the crowd because he appreciate the people and the crowd which are uh, during the match and uh you know uh absolutely i i i i really uh uh he's i respect him for that uh, and appreciate uh, his attitude, personal attitude and life attitude uh, so much because it gives a really nice message to not only uh, to to fans but also the young kids who wants to become a really great tennis player. Yeah, and he, uh, as far as expressing himself in a lot of different ways off the court, he's also a little bit of a jokester, which is how he got his name. His nickname, Joker, I was watching, uh, well, first of all, I've watched the press conference at the Australian Open about 400 times when he's like, not too bad when he talked when he talked to the Italian reporter. And that's just one of many times where Novak Djokovic has made people in tennis laugh. I mean, that may have been uh, that that may have been the greatest line in a press conference uh, I've ever seen. Um and, and that's just uh, that's just a big side of him. I also saw this morning, I went on YouTube, and he's played a lot of pranks on you, Mary. And there was one where I saw where you were like, he kept wanting you to like put your face in like some 
container of water and then it like <laughs> and then it sprayed up i don't know if you've ever seen this but it's on youtube then there was one time you guys were on the beach in australia and you went it looked like you ran like a mile in <laughs> into the ocean <laughs> Seems seems like seems like you guys have have a lot of fun. I, you know, it, it, everyone knows he is in some ways Joker, whether he likes that nickname or not. Um, he he had it early on when he did all the impressions of uh, of players. But uh, great sense of humor. And does he crack you up uh, pretty much every day when you're with him? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, absolutely. It's 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 one of the kind. This guy is never never stop laughing, never stop joking, and uh, it's always you know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, we have uh, on during the two two weeks and uh, during the actually Grand Slams, we have a lot of times, and it is a lot. It is a, we have uh, uh, so much time to to you know to to just you you can extend the time because it's kind of boring sometimes not but always we try to you know fit in between the the spare <laughs> time or free time something which which can really <laughs> you can you can we can uh, we can make a fun out of uh, out of things stuff persons and you know so we we, we use this time for for a, a lot of a lot of jokes and uh, not only not only for others but also for us <laughs> as a, as a, you know it, it's it's kind of humor which we our mentality is very similar slovak and serbian and uh, we a lot of lot of jokes uh, and uh, you know the stories we tell we it's 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 it suits to our our characters <laughs> let's say so we understand the uh, uh, any any kind of humor actually i understand jokes in serbia already a uh, little bit because the, the language is a little different uh, tough to understand but uh, I, I i learned during uh, those <laughs> many years uh, some some jokes around and we have a lot of fun we had a lot of fun and uh, it's it's maybe for the book <laughs> <laughs> yeah that that's uh that's what it seems like and finally marion i wanted to ask what is next, uh, not only for Novak Djokovic, but, uh, but for you individually a as a coach? Um, Novak just uh, broke the record for a number of weeks at number one with 331, and that's just an incredible milestone for him. Everybody loves to talk about, and why wouldn't they, the, uh, the race for most Grand Slams ever. 2020 with uh, with Nadal and Roger and Novak at at 18. Obviously, as his coach, you think he's going to uh, come out with the most of those three great champions. How many do you think he has left in him? And Rafa, I would say, has a couple more Frenches in him. Roger, you never know. If he's healthy, uh, you figure he can probably win one Wimbledon or two. What about Novak? He's, uh, he's, he's 33. He's the youngest. So... Where do you think he finishes in this group? Well, I am very pleased with his last uh, major uh, in Australian at the Australian Open, where he where he reached the the, the trophy. Also, he was a little bit injured, and I, I think I value this 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 win not only because it's eighteen, but it's it's eighteen, but it's also. Well, because he's so close to the to the Federer and Nadal, and uh, before was maybe by four, by three, a couple of years ago, but now it's getting really close. It's just, just really on distance, and uh, I think he's full of energy and full of strength and uh, full of motivation in him uh, already to accomplish his dream and to overpass uh, and and. Not overpass only 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 uh, Federer and Nadal, but they overpass Novak Djokovic. Uh, maybe, you know, just I, I hope because it, it, you need a lot of help and uh, not to get injured because it's very demanding. But as now uh, recently, Novak claimed uh, in the interview that he will not play fully scheduled. He will not have fully scheduled 2021 uh, every tournament or every Masters. Uh, serious, he will play only mostly Grand Slams, 
and uh, that confirms me, or I would say that gives him more calmness. That injury, he will be, he will prevent injury, and he will focus on the fitness and uh, uh, still improving his tennis. So uh, I think uh, mm, I don't want to say any numbers, but I already sentence that before that he can I think he can overpass uh, Novak Djokovic <laughs> <laughs> well he can, he can overpass in the trophy so <laughs> well that that's a great answer and then what about you Mary and what uh what is in store for you when uh assuming you're Novak's coach until he retires uh are, are you looking that far into the future you think you'd want to coach again you think you want to uh just hang out at the beach and and run two miles into the water when Novak uh, <laughs> <laughs> asked you that to? Would, that would be the best possible way, I mean, for retirement. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm still uh, having uh, quite a quite a good two years now, uh, not only with Novak, but uh, I'm still, I'm 56, so I'm really love, I have a pa still passion for this sport and we are uh, actually, uh, we have a group of young kids in Slovakia, which we are managing and not only managing, but coaching and we create a group of coaches here. So we are, I'm always in with tennis and uh, probably I always be uh, for a couple, next couple of years. And uh, so, as I mentioned before, my experience, my knowledge, uh, whatever I have uh, for, for so many years, I would like to give or, uh, uh, you know, I would like to give to the young kids, not only in Slovakia, but maybe some good talents which we can get under our management group of coaches and then good guys around. And, uh, and uh, you never know, you know. So I, I feel like I have still something, I have still more to come. <laughs> so you know and uh, uh, I don't force myself with anything anymore because I I fulfill my dreams with Nole and I and, and still it's going so I'm kind of the movie <laughs> well, I, am, I am in kind of the movie in, in well, kind of the movie <laughs> well it, it's a uh, it's been a great movie it's an Academy Award winner for sure and I want to thank you for coming on today this is uh this has really been a treat for me to uh, to get into your mind and um, and your coaching history and how you go about coaching uh, arguably the greatest player in the history of the game. Um, but you are a uh, you're a tremendous coach, um, so well respected throughout the world. And again, I want to thank you for uh, thank you for your time, Marion. It's been great. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate it so much. Anyhow. And uh, I wish you best luck, best luck, uh, all the listeners, and uh, lots of passion for, for this sport. It's really great sport. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.